Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into this episode of Schmooze. We're going to be hanging out with Adam Kaplan, co host of Inside the Birds. Adam, what is going on? Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, Hunter, good to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, it's um, it's another week with uh, covering the National Football League. I cover 32 teams, not just one. But when it's the team where, I'm, where I live, uh, when the team's doing badly, people are not happy. So it's I get it. You know, I grew up in the Philadelphia area, and I, I understand the passion of the Eagles fans, no, no doubt about it. Um, it's not unexpected that they will look the way that they do. The brand new, brand new coaches, brand new schemes and offensive defense. Um, I think a lot of us, including myself, got fooled by week one, and here we are, one and two, and they they host the Chiefs, who, quite frankly, uh, are a lot better than they are, but hey, that's why they play the games. You never know. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So I guess we'll start here with the head coach. You know, you mentioned the first week, and it was great, and you played a team that was a little weak, but as you progressed through the schedule, it got uglier against the 49ers, then even uglier against Dallas. So I guess I just want to know your opinion on the first three games of Nick Sirianni. I would say uneven, just like the quarterback. They're tied together. The head coach calls the plays. I would say that he looks like a rookie head coach who's calling plays for the first time. I think that it's gotten away from him uh, in terms of play calling. I think he completely lost the understanding of how you build a quarterback up who's only making his seventh start, which he did. Uh, we're talking about Jalen Hurts here, who started you know, four games last season. Throw the Washington game out. That was totally unfair and it just it, an abomination from the former staff, the way that was handled. Um, that Washington game, we all know that it was ridiculous what happened in that game. But you know, fast forwarding to now, when you look at the situation as is, you got to help a young quarterback. You have to have some sort of a running game. He's Jalen Hurts is a young quarterback in the infancy of his pro career. You want to do all that you can to help him. You need to give him a running game. He's not Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, <laughs> you know, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, th- these guys don't need a running game because they're, they're mature as quarterbacks. They've won a lot of games. They've they've Showing that they're stars. They, they've shown that they don't need a running game behind them. Although the Packers do have one, but the Rodgers doesn't necessarily need one. Jalen Hurts needs a running game. RPOs are fine. I, I, I understand you're trying to make him comfortable. But at some point, you've got to make some commitment to help him to ease up how much you're asking him to do. And that, that to me, and I'm not the only one who thinks that way. A lot of people smarter than I have said the same thing. I've, I've talked to a bunch of people I respect around the league about this. Just when I talk about... When I talk to personnel people, I always try to ask them, hey, have you seen Philly's tape? Got any opinion on it? Because of our show Inside the Birds, like what Jeff Mosher and I do. And it, the, the belief is uh, right now uh, that they're asking him to do way too much. And I, I think that's very, very fair. What did you think of his response today? We're recording this Wednesday night, and he just had his press conference, and he he mentioned that the RPO technically, you know, could be a run. So the way that they analyze that in terms of how many runs they have, they might interpret that as a run. But to me, it's like you're not putting it in a playmaker's hand, so that eliminates that specific idea. So it just it really didn't add up to me. And today, I just thought the tone of the presser was a little all over the place. It reminded me of day one of Nick Sirianni almost. Yeah, I want not quite that bad, but yeah, not that bad. But it just it gave me that um, that uh, I don't know. I didn't love the tone. I guess I I don't think he really. He's just so young as a play caller. He's only called plays in three games. I don't think he has a real good feel yet to what this offense should look like. That's the other thing. They have absolutely no identity. Okay, they're going to throw the ball a lot. Okay, great. What what? There are a lot of teams that throw the ball a lot, but they have definition to their offense. You know, kind of what you're getting with Kyle Shanahan. It's every it's everything is off the run game. Um, you know, you, you watch the Packers play action, roll Rogers out or he'll throw in the pocket. They're, they're, they're going to mix their running backs in because they have Aaron Jones, who's an absolute stud and they have, uh, AJ Dillon. I mean, we can go through all the teams and Matthew Stafford, um, everything's off the run game and, but the, yet they'll throw it a lot because they have unbelievable pass targets here. You've got a young group of receivers who are not developed yet, though. They, there's certainly a lot of upside. You've got two tight ends. One who's got a chance to be a star in Goddard. They just simply don't understand how to use him yet. It's just, uh, I, I think Sirianni is just behind the eight ball here. He's got a long way to go as a play caller. And I do believe he'll get it, but he's going to have to take his lumps. And it may, and Sunday could be very ugly. I, I, I Honestly, I don't know. I, I typically don't make my decision who I'm going to pick. Like last week, I was on Dallas the whole week. I just 
ch- I changed my pick the last minute like a moron. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that, Mosher had a name. He, t- Mo, Jeff had had a funny. He said something funny to me in text when I did that. Um, I only did it because I chose to believe that Sirianni would learn from his awful job play calling. Well, you know what? He said Francisco, it though. And he, like, he he says the right things even yeah, in training. He doesn't him. do He's, it. Yeah. Right, the execution side of it, it's just a little poor. But you guys do some, or you you hear from your personnel sources about uh, the tape study each week. You guys just dropped a podcast, yeah. and I'll put all the information to the Inside the Birds podcast, your Q&A shows, all that in the description of the episode as well. But I have a few questions about a couple of different people. We'll start with the quarterback. What did you learn when you heard about the tape study uh, about the flaws in his game? Yeah, I, I just think that, he reverted back to last year, other than the Arizona game, where I thought he played really well. I mean, I, I, I've i mentioned that many times on Inside the Birds. Hurts played so well in that game. And that was, And remember, that was the game where they he took a safety on the first series. And my first response with that game was, oh, this is going to be a long day. I remember texting Mosher about it, like, this is not going to be good, this game. And then he hung in there mentally. And that, that taught me a lot about him. It really did. To to And let's fast forward to now. You know, he, he was he was – accountable he did play poorly we all know that we saw it it has absolutely nothing to do with their offensive line i i there's some stuff out there it's just flat out wrong it, it doesn't have anything to do with it because the, the the line was decent it wasn't great but i've run it by three people i have absolute respect for around the league and they all saw the tape so he said the same thing the line was not a problem they had they had their own division it wasn't perfect you know if you ranked it to one to ten it was probably a six but you could you could win with a six you can't win with a three but it was it was good enough. It just that hurts for whatever reason had in his mind that if he didn't get what he wanted initially, he was going to move. And you don't need to do that. You don't want him doing that. Um, so that 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 can't happen. He could he's shown he could throw from the pocket. Sure, you 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 run RPOs. Um, you 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 can move you can move him a little bit when you want to move him. But the 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 head coach will make that decision on the play call. The quarterback cannot make the decision on his own. And it just what happens is. And if you watch the all 22 tape at the NFL.com, you could see this. You could see exactly what I'm talking about. Watch him bail and watch the pass targets go over the middle. And this is what happened. It didn't happen much against the Niners because Sirianni just didn't have enough uh, inside inside routes. But this game he did. And Hurts, when he broke the pocket, he did not maintain his, maintain his downfield focus. And that that's a big reason why he didn't play well. But he'll learn from it. The good thing is that it's all in tape study. He'll see it. They'll go over it with them. They'll drill them on it. But it's only up to him because, as coaches will tell you, you can only show players so much. At some point, they have to do it. Now, if they don't do it over a series of weeks, you're going to have a real problem with quarterback. Yeah, no doubt. And ironically enough, you brought up the line. So how did Andre Dillard grade out with that first game? See, I thought everyone freaked out considering the last time you really remember him was the right tackle, and he's not going to be playing right tackle. I figured heading into it that he would – Hold his own. He'd be serviceable. Would there be times where he got beat? Absolutely. That's inevitable. But he'd be better than what the most fans would think just based off of the last time they saw him. What did you hear about Dillard? Yeah, actually good. I talked to someone on Wednesday who said that uh, his technique was really good. Now, understand, they didn't ask him to block for the run game because Sanders only ran it twice and Gainwell had one carry for two yards. Right. Um, So, But his pass blocking was really good, like solid. Um, Had one penalty. Uh, his technique, because here's the thing, Jeff Stalin teaches that the hands are lower. It's a it's a learned technique. It's not. It's uh, Trey Thomas taught to, uh, kind of explained this last year when um, he would do our pregame show, and it's it's not like they're taught in college. So you have to you have to learn this. It takes time. You're not going to learn it in like a season. It takes time. And his hand usage was really good. Now, and he handled the guys that came at him in pass pro. But again, he wasn't asked to run block. So if they would have run the ball like they should have. Maybe he wouldn't have done well with the run because that's not his forte. Remember, he he almost exclusively pl- played in a pass set in college because that's the kind of offense that he played it. Right. No, absolutely. So then let's go to the right guard position. What about Landon Dickerson? It seemed like he had a, a tougher day at the office. I would say that uneven, but certainly better than the first game when he got thrown in there. Um, in the seven max protection play, he <laughs> they had a they had a when you have a seven man protection, your quarterback should not get hit. And they, he gave up the pressure there, but better his thing. This is exactly what we, we've, we must, I don't know how many times we said this on our show. 
when he gets in there, it's going to take him some time, but he's going to be a stud. I, you know, it, it, it's no surprise that he's not going to be perfect. His first ever NFL start. Um, no, it's kind of what you expect. He'll get better. And he, he actually did. He, the good thing is the good plays that he had, you go, okay, this is, this is kind of what you expect. And, and, um, you know, in pass pro was he perfect? No. Um, but he'll get better. Look, their line all individual. They all had, you know, their moments where it could have been better. That's what you expect. And remember now they're playing with, they're, they're playing now technically with three backups, unfortunately, uh, for the time being, because I uh, would say Malo out for the season and my you know, with the MCL sprain and then, uh, you know, Brooks, who's going to be out a while longer. You just, this is what you have and they're going to have to make the best of it. Yeah, you know what's crazy? I feel we're spoiled here in Philadelphia. If you were in any other city, for the most part, not every team, but the fact that you have Dickerson and Dillard, and these are your backup options, most teams would get annihilated if they had to use three teams. And this team might get annihilated, but as you said, it's not really because the offensive line, if they give you a six, that's sort of a winnable method. So in, in terms of, you know, being able to survive, if you will, but yeah, you know, we're spoiled here with offensive line play with Jeff Stoutland and how he grooms these players. Yep. Uh, I, I do want to flip it over to the defense, though. So it, it did seem that with the Cowboys, especially early on, it wasn't as if it was this magic by Kellen Moore. They were just really running it down your throats. And, you know, just the way that they played it schematically defensively, it was getting torched o- torched over and over again. Uh, what did you see with Jonathan Gannon? Well, no, I get uh, Kel Moore called a great game. He, oh, he he's, definitely did. He's, for sure. excep- he's an exceptional play caller. He's one of the probably top five. It's really amazing. This guy, as a quarterback, had no arm at all. He's really smart out of Boise. I remember at the senior bowl. I never thought he'd make it, but he was a long time journeyman backup, and he's really sharp. He's probably going to be head coach someday. And they, they knew exactly what they were getting. Their line blew the Eagles' line off the ball. Um, they had 77 yards rushing from Elliott and Pollard in the first quarter. You know it was going to be a long night. Uh, the pass game concepts were good. Um, they took advantage. They they did they did some six, six offensive linemen uh, with McGovern, the lineman from Penn State. I think he might have had eight plays of doing it. And you know, I thought Cooper, uh, I thought Mark Cooper would have to be a big deal for them to win. It didn't. He didn't matter. It didn't even matter what he only had three for 26. He was an afterthought. You know, Lamb had the the Eagles um, had a had a mistake in coverage uh, on Lamb for that 44 yard of the safety was late, but you know, Dalton Schultz um, by scheme, they, they schemed him open. It was, it was just, look, they, again, got out coached to learn from it. He, he's another guy, by the way. And I have to keep telling myself this Sirianni and Gannon are first time play callers. This is only the third time calling third game calling plays. It's, it's not always going to be pretty. One of the reasons why I had them having seven or eight wins, but I still think they're going to get to, because if you see the schedule is murders road cut up Hunter. But the second half of the season is much better, at least on paper, what these teams look now. Like Washington is not as good as I thought. Their defense has been awful. Giants are not nearly as good as I thought. Um, they got to play the Jets. Uh, they, they have some w- very winnable games, but coming up, it's going to be tough. But the good thing is you're going to see some great teams playing the Eagles. Right. Yeah, no, that's very true. And I guess, so we heard Nick Sirianni speak after the game and heading into this one, I said, let's not make it a shootout because you know, the Dallas Cowboys can score. I don't want to put up as many points as they do. Like that's a scary method. Let's run the ball, be methodical, keep Dak Prescott on the sidelines. But you know, then we heard that they wanted to keep up with the Cowboys. And I just guess that that mentality to me is almost like, let's try and hang in there. Let's try and hold on instead of Let's and you alluded to this earlier with the identity. You know, let's stay true to us. Let's stay true to our identity and try and do this. I, I don't know. I just I didn't love the idea of let's try and make this a high scoring game. That seemed like a recipe for disaster right from the jump. It was. Um, you know, they're only down twenty to seven at halftime. Uh, then unfortunately, now once it became twenty seven to seven when Diggs had the fifty nine yard int, which is by the way, it was a uh, Diggs read his eyes, uh, hurts his eyes. He's a tell. Uh, I was told that he, he there's a indicator with the way that he st- he stares down the pass target and they they caught onto it and it had nothing to do with, uh, I was it wasn't this is why you can't go by TV tape I thought for sure is because Devontae Smith fell down I was told by two people who would know it had nothing to do with him falling down he would have been picked and whether uh, Smith was six foot nine or not it just uh, Diggs read it and it's a great play by the way Trayvon Diggs is going to be a Pro Bowler this year he's he's he had a great training camp. I was with the Cowboys uh, in um, in Oxnard when the Rams were there for for practice. He he he's going to be a stud. Uh, but I'll tell you this: I learned uh, you know when the when the Titans were down twenty four to nine at halftime, 
um, at at Seattle. They still ran the ball. Now, I'm not a run game guy. I'm a pass game guy. I don't believe that you have to run the ball. You need to pass the ball a lot, but you also have to know who your quarterback is. When Now, there might be a time in the season if, if, if Hurts – Hunter, I'll leave you with this. If he has a series of games, you're going, oh, man, he's getting it. He's hanging in the pocket. He's executing uh, the plays like they're supposed to be. I'm all for throwing him 35 to 30 times a game. They had 39 attempts. Uh, inexcusable. Just Sirianni was in over his head in this game. He, he didn't have a feel for it right now. But I'm choosing to believe, based on the people I've talked to have coached with him before, um, whether it was at Indy or Kansas City or the Chargers, um, who these guys speak well, very well. I choose to believe he'll eventually get it. I know fans aren't patient. I totally understand that. But me, as someone who analyzes the game and reports on 32 teams, I know how it is. You, you, you know, you call it like you see it when it happens, but you have to understand it's going to happen because he's he's got a long ways to go to get a feel for what really needs to get done. Yeah, no doubt. I I feel he has it in him. It's just it's a whole learning process. And yeah. You got to go through those ups and downs to to really uh, study yourself. All right, I know you got to run real quick. I ask everybody this question before we head out. Uh, your thoughts, and it's funny because the timeline changes when this question's asked. Uh, okay. Your thoughts on Ben Simmons? Yeah, I'm um, I'm extremely disappointed with with his, just his understanding of what it takes. Like you, you would see his comments on Twitter over the last year or so about, you know, the love hate relationship the fans have with him. He kind of got, it. I thought he got it. And then he's just overly sensitive. I, I I do wonder how much he loves basketball. What's, what's more important to him? Like Joel Embiid for his gregarious nature, which I absolutely love. He's one of my favorite all time Philadelphia athletes. He totally gets Philly. Mike Schmidt, you're, you know, you weren't alive when he was in his heyday, right? In the, in the eighties. Yeah. Schmitty, Really never truly got it, and he got booed a lot. He, there was a love-hate relationship with the fans. Jaws got it. That's what Jaws took it like a man, the booing. But Mike Schmidt never quite was embraced like he should have been because he was so overly sensitive. Mike Schmidt would have moved out of town. If, if he was on Twitter now playing yeah. baseball, <laughs> maybe he would have left. Yeah, probably. No, you're right. You yeah, know, so right. I'm, it really disappoints me that he couldn't take the heat. Uh, Sims can't take the heat. I do. I would say this, Dal Morey, if he's going to trade Simmons, if they don't get a big time shooter, I don't know if they're going to get Bradley Beal, but I, I want a big time, big time shooter. If they can do that, I don't know that the Blazers would do Lillard, but he's unbelievable, obviously. But they got to get a shooter and a big a guy's got to be big time who makes no doubt that you don't worry about trading Simmons because right now Simmons, for all of his faults, with his length and his, and his ability to play defense. You're not going to find guys. It's very rare in the NBA. I've, I've watched basketball now about 40 years. It's uh, it's pretty amazing what he's able to do. But the the frustration part of it, with his w unwillingness to shoot, and his lack of accountability, is really bothers me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's it's crazy the way this all played out. But Adam Kaplan, co-host of Inside the Birds, you got your Inside the Birds pregame show. You got the podcast dropping Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You got the Q&A show. We'll have all the information down below. Absolutely go check that out. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You got it, my friend. Thank you.